Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study tonight as we talk about growing through adversity, um, growing through adversity. And we're going to focus on James chapter one, verses two through four, where it reads, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for another Wednesday night, another opportunity to study your word, Father God. And Lord, we ask that you just make this word plain for us to understand and, and we're able to apply it to our daily lives and spread the good news. Father, we thank you for all that you are doing you have done and all that you're doing in our lives. We continue to pray for those that are sick among us. We continue to pray for those that are going through bereavement at this time. Lord, we just give you the praise on this evening and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're going to talk about growing through adversity. And one of the many fascinating events um, in nature is the emergence of, um, of a moth from its cocoon. An event that occurs only with much struggle of part of the month to free itself. So the story is frequently told of someone who watched a moth go in, uh, go through this struggle in an effort to help and not realizing the necessity of the struggle. The person that viewed this, they snipped the shell of the cocoon and soon the moth came out with its wings all crimped and shriveled. But as the person watched, the wings remained weak. The moth, which in a few moments would have stretched those wings to fly, and that moth was now doomed um, to crawling out of its brief life in frustration of ever being the beautiful creature that God created it to be. So what the person in the story did not realize was that the struggle to emerge from the cocoon was the essential part of developing the muscle system of the moth's body and pushing the body fluids out into the wings to expand them. By unwisely seeking to cut short the moth's struggle, the watcher had um, actually crippled the moth and doomed its existence. So the adversities of life are much like the cocoon of this moth. God uses them to develop the spiritual muscle system of our lives. And as James say in, James say in our text for this chapter, he says the testing of your faith through trials of many kinds develops perseverance and perseverance leads to maturity of our character. So we can be sure that the development of a beautiful Christ-like character will not occur in our lives without adversity. Um, think of those lovely graces that Paul calls the fruit of the spirit. He, he mentions this in Galatians chapter five, verses um, 22 through 23. The first four traits he mentions, he mentions love, he mentions joy, peace, and patience, and they can only be developed in the womb of adversity. Um, we may think we have true Christian love until someone offends us or treats us unjustly. And then we begin to see anger and resentment well up in, within all of us. Um, if you ever go through those things, I know I've experienced that. Amen. But adversity it spoils our peace and sorely try our patience. And God uses those, those difficulties to reveal to us our need to grow so that we will reach out to him to change us more and more into the likeness of his son. Both Paul and James, they speak of rejoicing in our suffering. If you were to look at Romans chapter five, verses three through four, and James chapter one, um, verses two through four, and I think that was on the guide that I gave you a couple weeks ago. If you looked at those verses, or if you could take a look at them a little later, um, you will see that Paul speaks of rejoicing in our sufferings. And most of us, if we are honest with ourselves, we have difficulty rejoicing <laughs> in our sufferings. We have difficulty, difficulty with that idea. But Paul and James, they both say that we should rejoice in our trials because of their beneficial results. It is not the adversity considered in itself 
This is to be gr the ground of our joy. Rather, it is the expectation of the results, the development of our character that should cause us to rejoice in adversity. God does not ask us to rejoice because we have lost our job or we have lost a loved one or we have been stricken down with cancer or a child has been born with an, uh, a birth defect that's incurable. Um, but he does tell us to rejoice because we believe he is in control of those circumstances and he is at work through them for our ultimate good. Um, the Christian life is intended to be one continuous growth. We all want to grow, but we often resist the process. And so this is because we tend to focus on the events of adversity themselves rather than looking with the eye of faith beyond the events to what God is doing in our lives. It was said of Jesus that he, for the joy, set before him, endured the cross, scorning his shame. And you can see that in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Uh, so this brings us to understanding that God works through adversity, that he works through adversity. And so fortunately, God does not ask us how or when we want to grow. He is the master. And he's the master teacher. He's training us, which we are his pupils. Um, he's training his pupils when and how he deems best. God intends that we grow through the uh, disciplines of adversity as well as through the instruction from his word. Um, the Psalms is in 94, 90 Psalms 94, 12. The Psalms is joins adversity and instruction together in God's training process. When he says, blessed is the man you discipline, O Lord, the man you teach from your law. So we see here that God is at work in each and every one of us, regardless of how aware of it we may be. Uh, one of the most encouraging passages in the Bible is uh, Philippians chapter one, verse six. And I, I always talk about this particular verse, but it says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. Listen, God is at work in us and he will not fail to carry on to completion that which he has begun. He will work in us what is pleasing to him. He will work in us what is pleasing to him. Not pleasing to us, but pleasing to him. God cannot fail in his purpose for adversity in our lives that, that, that he will accomplish that which he intends. It, 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 that's a great encouragement to me because sometimes I do fail to respond to difficulties in a God honoring, honoring way. And I'm pretty sure we all do. But my failure does not mean that God has failed. Even my painfully sharp awareness of failure may be used of God. For example, it's, it's, it's to help me grow in humility. To help me grow in humility, every adversity that comes across our path, whether it's large or whether it's small, it's intended to help us grow in some way. And if we were not beneficial, God, or if it were not beneficial, God would not allow it or he would not send it. God does not delight in our sufferings. That's another thing we have to understand. He doesn't delight in our suffering. He brings only that which is necessary, but he does not shrink from that which will help us grow. Understand this, that we learn from adversity. That's the next point I want to point out. We learn from adversity. God's sovereign work, it, it never negates our responsibility. Just as God um, teaches us through adversity, we must seek to learn from it. And there are several things that we can do in order to learn from adversity and receive it or receive the beneficial effects that God intends. First is that we can submit to it. And, and not re reluctant, reluctantly, as the defeated uh, general submits to his conqueror, but voluntarily as the patient on the operating table submits to the skilled hand of the surgeon as he wails his knife. Uh, do not try to frustrate the gracious purpose of God by resisting his providence in your life. We should accept from God's hands, the success or failure of those means as he wills or as or as he wills and at all times seek to learn whatever he might be teaching us. The second thing is that we got to profit most from or the second thing that we can profit most from adversity is that we should um, 
we should bring the word of God to bear upon the situation. Um, we should ask God to bring to our attention those important passages of scriptures and then in dependence on him to do so, look for those passages. Listen, there are many times when I'm going through something and I have to go to Google and, and, and just type in whatever I'm going through. If I'm going through depression, I'll find scriptures around depressions and I'll, I'll pray and I will ask the Lord to, to guide me, um, to take me to a scripture that's going to help me go through this process. And that's what we have to do. We have to to seek out, seek him out, seek to him. And as we seek to relate to the scriptures, to our adversities, we'll find that we will not only profit from the circumstances themselves, but we're going to gain new insight into the scriptures. We'll gain new insight into the scriptures. The third thing, in order to profit from our adversities, we must remember them and the lessons that we learn from them. Listen, God wants us to do more than simply endure our trials even more than merely find a uh, comfort in them. He wants us to remember them, not just as trials or sorrows, but as his, uh, as his, as his disciplines or, you know, as his disciplines, uh, you know, he, he wants to discipline us. You understand? So as his, as he disciplines us, um, his means of bringing about growth in our lives, he said this to the Israelites, remember how the Lord, your God, led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. He taught them this in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 through 3. Uh, God wanted to teach the Israelites that they were dependent upon him for their daily bread. And he did this not only by incorporating this truth into the law of Moses, but by bringing adversity in the form of hunger into their lives. But in order to profit from this lesson, they must remember it. They must remember it. Listen, <laughs> this is some good stuff uh, because when you look at some of the things that you've gone through in your life and you look at some of the struggles that the Lord have allowed you to go through, and then you look at how he provided for you and how he brought you out of certain certain situations. You ought to remember that. You ought to remember that because you may be faced with something else or you may need to give a word to somebody else to have them come out of the situation that you were in. So it's important to remember it. And he takes you through these things so that you can remember it. The next thing is pruning. Um, Jesus said that every branch that does bear fruit prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. He says this in John chapter 15, verse two. So in the natural realm, pruning is important for bearing fruit. Um, an unpruned vine will produce a great deal of unproductive growth, but little fruit. So cutting away unwanted and useless growth, it forces the plant to use its life to produce fruit. In the spiritual realm, God must prune us. Because even as believers, we still have a sinful nature. We, we tend to pour our spiritual energies into that which is not true fruit. Uh, God uses adversity to loosen our grip on those things that are not true fruit. Uh, a severe illness or, or, or the death of someone dear to us, the loss of material substance or the tarnishing of our reputation, uh, the turning aside of friends or the dashing of our cherished dreams on rocks of failure, it causes us to think about what is really important in life. Position or possessions or even reputation, it no longer seems important when you deal with stuff like that. We begin to relinquish our desires and our expectations, even good ones, to the sovereign will of God. And we come more and more to depend on God and to desire only that which will count for eternity. God is pruning us so, so, so that we will be more fruitful. And we've already talked about holiness probably within the last uh, couple of months or so. But God, um, he, he discipline, discipline, disciplines us through adversity for our good that we may share in his holiness. Hebrews 12, 10 talks about this. For, for one thing, adversity reveals the corruption of our sinful nature. Um, we do not know ourselves or the depths of sin 
remaining in us. We agree with the teachings of the scripture and we assume that the agreement means obedience. At least we intend to obey. We intend to obey. Um, who of us does not read that list of Christian virtues called the fruit of the spirit? You know, the Christian virtues, we just, we talked about that, where the uh, love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Who does not read that list, all of that, and agree that we want all those traits in our lives? I don't think no one will read all those fruits of the spirits, all of those traits, and say, hey, I don't want any of that in our lives. There is some of those fruits that you want in your life. But then you got adversity that comes. And we find that we are unable to love from the depths of our heart the person who has the, uh, the instrument of the adversity. We find we don't want to forgive that person. We realize we are not um, disposed to trust God. Unbelief and resentment begins to surge within us. We are dismayed at the scene. The growth in Christian character we thought had in occurred our lives or had occurred in our lives, it seems to vanish like a vapor. And we feel as if we are back in spiritual kindergarten again. But through this experience, God has revealed to us some of the remaining corruption that's within us. We all got it, y'all. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. If you look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 and 4 and 6, all of these descriptions refer to the believer who has been humbled over his sinfulness, who mourns because of it and yearns with all his heart for God to change him. In making us holy, God goes, he goes deeper than um, just our specific sins we may be conscious of. He wants to get to the root cause, uh, the, um, the root cause of those sins. And as we look to God to use his discipline in our lives, we may be sure it will in due time produce a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. The next thing we want to talk about is dependence. This is another area of our lives that God must continually be at work uh, or that he has to work on because um, we have a tendency to rely on ourselves instead of him. Um, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And I wish that a lot of people would get this. I wish that a lot of people would get this. Apart from me, you can do nothing. This is in John chapter 15, verse 5. There are so many people in this world right now that are on their own agenda. They're on their 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 they're they're moving on their own plan, and they don't include Jesus in it. Jesus ain't a part of it. Listen. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Yeah, you may be able to launch that business or, 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 or launch these different things, but was Jesus in it? Because I'm here to tell you, even though it may be successful for a while, you got to understand that sometimes God is trying to take you to a higher level and we are at a low level of thinking, low level of thinking because we excluded Jesus from those um, things or those goals or, or those decisions that we make. It's important to always keep Jesus. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Listen, I can only testify by my, by my own self. I, I don't really even get into talking about others, even though I see this clearly with a lot of people. But just to give you an example for me, I think that in my personal life, I would have been further along than I am now had I included Jesus in the beginning. It, had I included him in the beginning, oh, ain't no telling where I would be. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. It wasn't until I started allowing him in and, and allowing him to, you know, be a part of those decisions and make sure that I am doing what his will is for me. That's when I start progressing and 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 start um, moving forward. But I could have been a lot, uh, could have been further, a lot longer. I mean, could have been 
way past where I'm at now had I included Jesus. We live in a world that worships independence and self-reliance. And we know we hear this all the time. You know, uh, teenagers, when they turn 18, they want to be independent. I know when I turned 18, I was ready to get out of the house. I was so ready to get out of the house till when I went to college, I didn't even come home half the time, majority of the time. I, I can count on my hand how many times I came home uh, <laughs> pretty much all of my years in college. And it was because I wanted to be so independent. And we live in a world that's like that, that worships independence and self-reliance. We tend to rely on our knowledge of scripture, our own business, um, our, our ministry experience, and even our goodness and, and morality. God has to teach us through adversity to rely on him instead of ourselves. And even the Apostle Paul said of his difficulties, which he described as far beyond our ability to endure, that they occurred so that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. And he said that in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, God allowed Paul and his band of men to be uh, brought into a situation so desperate that they they despaired even of life itself. They had no place to turn except to God. And Paul had to learn dependence on God in spiritual as well as the physical realm. And whatever his thorn in his flesh was, it was an an adversity that Paul desperately wanted to be rid of. We all know the story, but uh, God let that thorn remain, not only to curb any tendency for pride in Paul's heart, but also to teach him to rely on God's strength, to teach him to rely on God's strength. So here we have Paul. Um, the next thing we want to talk about is perseverance. And this is uh, the recipients of this letter to the Hebrews. The, you know, Hebrews is a letter. Excuse me one second. And so the recipients of this letter that's written in Hebrews they were experiencing a great deal of adversity. And the writer of the letter, he acknowledged that they stood their ground in the face of suffering, um, that sometimes they were publicly exposed to insult and persecution, and they um, joyfully accepted the confis uh, confiscation or of them taking, you know, t pretty much taking their property because they um, knew they had better and lasting possessions. Um, so I couldn't pronounce that word, but but them basically getting their property taken away from them. And to these people who are ex ex who were experiencing such persecution and hardship for their faith in Christ, the writer, he began to write and he said, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, that you will receive what he has promised. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Uh, perseverance is the quality of character that enables one to pursue a goal in spite of obstacles and those difficulties that we face. See, it's one thing to simply bear up under adversity. Um, this in itself is commendable, but God calls us to do more than simply bear the load of adversity. He calls us to preserve. Um, to, I mean, to persevere. He calls us to press forward in the face of it. Not only, not how the writer of Hebrews focuses on reaching the goal. Uh, when you have done the will of God and run the race marked out for us. If you can note this, the Christian life is meant to be active. So you see, it says when you have done the will of God and run the race marked out for us. Um, the Christian life is meant to be active and not passive. The Christian is also called to pursue with diligence the will of God. And to do this requires perseverance. Oh, yes, it requires perseverance, y'all. That's what I'm talking about. The next thing is service. God also brings adversity in our lives to equip us more for effective service. This is my favorite one here, effective service. All that we have considered so far, we considered pruning, we considered um, holiness, we considered dependence, we considered perseverance. All of that contributes to making us useful instruments in God's service. God could have brought Joseph directly to Pharaoh's palace without um, taking him 
through the prison. And he certainly did not need to leave Joseph to languish in prison for two more years after he had interpreted the cupbearer's dream. Joseph's difficult circumstances were not necessary just for him to be in the right place at the right time. They were necessary to make him into the right kind of person for the responsibilities God would give him. The Apostle Paul wrote that God comforts us. He comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in um, any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Uh, everyone faces times of adversity and everyone is going to need a compassionate and caring friend to come alongside to comfort and encourage them in those times. Uh, that, that's something that we all would need. The next thing is the fellowship of suffering. The Apostle John, he was writing to the persecuted believers of the seven churches in Asia. He identified himself as young brother and companion in, in suffering that is ours in Jesus. Revelations chapter 1, verse 9. John identified himself as one who shared together with his readers in sufferings that they were enduring. He could understand their afflictions since he was at the time at that time also suffering for the sake of Jesus. John was a partaker with them in their suffering. And it was important to the effective communication of his message that they understood that fact. Trials and afflictions have a leveling effect among believers. It has often been said that the ground is level at the foot of the cross. This is regardless of our wealth, our power, our station in life. Uh, we are all alike in the need for our Savior. Understand that trials and afflictions also have a mutual drawing effect among believers. Um, they tend to break down barriers between us and dissolve any appearance of self-sufficiency that we may have. And we find our hearts warmed and drawn toward one another. We sometimes worship together with another person. We pray together and even serve together in the ministry without ever truly bond, uh, having a bond of fellowship. But then in a strange way, you let adversity strike us both. Immediately, we sense a new bond of fellowship in Christ. The fellowship of suffering. Uh, so we want to close with talking about the relationship with God. Perhaps the most valuable way that we're going to profit from adversity is in um, deepening our relationship with God. So through adversity, we learn to bow before his sovereignty, to trust his wisdom and to experience um, his love until we come to the place where we can say uh, with Job, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Uh, Job 42, 5, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. And we began to pass from knowing about God to knowing God himself in a personal and intimate way. Hallelujah. Oh, and hallelujah. Repeatedly in the Bible, we see men and women of God. They are drawn into a deeper relationship with God through adversity. There is no doubt that all the circumstances um, in the long delay of the birth of Isaac and then experience um, of taking his only son up to the mountain to offer as a sacrifice. You remember that, uh, that Abraham did that into a deeper, a much deeper relationship with God. Um, that sacrifice brought him into a deeper relationship with God. Um, the Psalms are, 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 has a lot of expressions and ever deep knowledge of God. As Psalms, Psalms is, they seek him in times of adversities. You can see that in Psalms 23, where it talks about the Lord is my shepherd. Go and read that. You will see the adversity there in Psalms 42, in Psalm 61, in Psalm 62. All of that was on that God a couple of weeks that I gave you. You and I obviously do not seek out adversity just so we can develop a deeper relationship with God. Rather, God through adversity, he seeks us out. It is God who draws us more and more into a deeper relationship with him. And if we are seeking him, it is because he is seeking us. One of the strong cords with which he draws us into more intimate personal relationship with him is adversity. If instead of fighting God or, or doubting him in times of adversity, if we would seek to cooperate with God, 
we will find that we will be drawn into a deeper relationship with him. We will come to know him as Abraham and Job and, and David and Paul as they came to know him. We, we have seen some of the ways that we may profit from adversity. We know that adversity is profitable, but there is no question that adversity is difficult. I, I don't think nobody thinks it's easy. Um, but it is difficult. It is usually it usually takes us by surprise and it seems to strike where we are most vulnerable at. Um, to us, it often appears completely senseless and it's sometimes irrational. Um, but to God, none of it is either senseless or irrational. Um, he has a purpose in every pain he brings or allows in our lives. And we can ensure or we can be sure that in some way he intends for our profit and his glory. He intends for our profit and his glory. Listen, that is the word for today. Growing, 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 growing. I don't know about you, but I, I want to grow through adversity. All of my trials and tribulations, I want to make sure that I am growing through adversity because that is what they're, they're, they come for, is to make us stronger and wiser Amen. Amen. Listen, we thank you so much for tuning in for this word on this evening for this Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, join us Sunday as we celebrate Youth Sunday. We, you know, we celebrate that every fourth Sunday. So join us Sunday at 11 a.m. for worship as we celebrate Youth Sunday. Um, please, if you would like, comment, share and subscribe on this video. Um, we will. We, we thank you so much. You all are certainly a blessing. Um, and so you all be blessed and we will reconvene for morning worship for you Sunday, this Sunday at 11 a.m. Amen. You all be blessed. Have a good day. Amen.